For the past two years, I've begun every Saturday morning the same way. I grab a coffee before heading to the dance studio to teach my morning Tiny Toes class to the adorable little toddlers. I've always had an affinity for spending time with little kids because of the precious things they say and do. While I have been a substitute teacher for a variety of different age groups and classes, I most enjoy teaching the four and five-year-olds because I can ask them questions, have somewhat real conversations with them, and, and watch them grow and improve the most throughout the course of the year. To take attendance, I always begin class with a question. The first few weeks, I take it easy on them and ask questions like, what's your favorite color? But then, once they get to know me a little more, I like to spice it up. So I ask them, if you could combine any two animals, which two would you combine? To which one toddler replied, a lion and a water bottle, which yeah, I'd kind of like to see that too. However, one girl who I'll call Sarah for the sake of privacy never responded to my questions. Does she not like me? Am I doing something wrong? I asked myself after the first few weeks of class. Little did I know, at almost five years old, Sarah had yet to speak her first words and was considered nonverbal by both her speech therapists and doctors. Her mom explained to me that while Sarah understands speech, she doesn't offer a verbal reply. Will she utilize nonverbal cues such as nodding when I asked her if the steps made sense? I wanted to find a more personal way of connecting with her since verbal language was obviously not the medium she preferred. By emphasizing the rhythm of a tap step and its sound, I saw a lot of progress. Instead of describing the step out loud, I broke down each component and made it as loud as I could, which my fellow dancers know is not really how you learn how to tap. Anyway, as the weeks progressed, she grew more and more comfortable with me, one day even reaching out her hand so that I could help her balance as we took the more challenging tap steps across the floor which was also happy, helpful for me since I never learned how to tap beyond maybe the second grade. By the end of the year, we'd arrived at the holiday performance for the parents. After finishing their routine to root off the red-nosed reindeer, I passed out candy canes to send the kids off to winter break. Sarah ran up to me and gave me a big hug. Her mom, with a huge smile on her face, said that Sarah had only ever hugged her a handful of times before. For the coming weeks, I could not quite seem to wrap my head around why she felt so comfortable with me. After all, I only saw her an hour a week and during dance class, I nearly drowned of curiosity, wondering what exactly it was that I was doing to make her feel comfortable and understood. In January of 2020, I joined the Magical Bridge Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Board for Teens, which furthered my knowledge and compassion for those with developmental disabilities. As a team member, I researched, in, I researched inequities that this marginalized group experiences and looked into some solutions. I learned that this organization had already made tremendous strides for this community by creating a playground equipped for people of all abilities. I was fortunate to work with the foundation CEO, Alenka, who created the organization for her 17-year-old daughter who is nonverbal and requires assistance with nearly all aspects of day-to-day -day activities, as she functions primarily at the level of a neurotypical two-year-old. At her high school, Alenka's daughter does not receive an adequate education. Instead, she delivers mail to, mail to classrooms and waters plants around the campus. These activities aren't meaningful to her because they don't match her developmental level. Through a process of learning called active learning, which my team and I observe from both neurological and behavioral perspectives, students are encouraged to learn at their developmental level. For students with unmatched developmental and chronological ages, this might be parallel play with blocks or playing with Play-Doh to develop sensory motor skills. While this seems so obvious, this approach to education is only implemented in three high schools in the United States. So, after researching this style of learning, my team and I put together a series of videos and blog articles to present to the city of Palo Alto, encouraging the implementation of this process. Another major component of tools and therapies that can be helpful for these types of learners is vestibular motion. The vestibular system, which is our inner ear balancing mechanism, works closely with the visual system to help coordinate movement and send this information throughout our brain. 
The development of the vestibular system occurs through physical activity and is important for both motor and cognitive skills. Additionally, this system is important because it helps maintain balance, improve visual tracking, develop muscle coordination, support language development, and encourage self-regulation. Vestibular motion is standing up, turning, or even zipping up your jacket. It is crucial for self-sufficiency. Thus, in order for a process of active learning to actually take off, kids have to move around and continue to develop their neurological skills. After noticing how well Sarah had seemed to catch on to the new steps, I was so curious what might explain these events. Well, now I can give all the credit to active learning and how huge of a component vestibular motion is in dance and movement, even if it's baby ballet. Part of what makes the human brain so confusing to understand is that its pathways are so interwoven. Now, bear with me here, we're about to talk neuroscience. Not surprisingly, the route that neurons take to get to the vestibular system makes this region very closely related to our sympathetic nervous system, or our fight or flight response. Among the list of involuntary actions that our sympathetic nervous system is responsible for is the production and release of endorphins, which are almost like a natural morphine that our brain produces. These chemicals are released and produced to reduce stress and relieve pain and have many associations with the neurotransmitter dopamine, another feel-good chemical. Now, endorphins are released through the processes of the sympathetic nervous system, which is where the information from our vestibular system is directly sent. So, the vestibular system majorly interacts with the release of endorphins, which is why it is so important for us to get up and move around. Congratulations, you now understand the neuroscience of exercise. After returning from our winter break, we begin the dance for the annual show in June. While working on some of the choreography with one of the groups of students, out of the corner of my eye, I see Sarah standing giggling in the mirror. I run over to her and ask, what are you laughing at, silly girl? Expecting her to point or nod, typical nonverbal cues. I gaze behind me into the window. I see Sarah's baby sister sitting in a stroller. I hear this tiny sweet voice say, there is a baby outside, only to realize Sarah was the one speaking. At nearly five years old, Sarah had spoken her first words and to me during dance class. I was shocked. I scrambled to continue the conversation by confirming that yes, there was a baby outside, her super tiny baby sister, and how one day her baby sister will be as big as her. This was one of those moments where time froze. Even after getting to know Sarah for months, this was not something that I ever imagined happening. I'm very pleased to say that since then, with the right forms of therapies and tools, Sarah is now a loquacious gal, and she has many fr new friends with whom she enjoys spending time. And her two favorite animals are unicorns and kittens, so we can just imagine what those would look like combined. I think what initially drew me to Sarah was that I saw and see a lot of myself in her. I could tell from the shy way she presented herself and avoided eye contact that she's a very kind girl who's just having a tough time. Since her age, I too have felt so at home at the dance studio. Through the universal rough patch, commonly known as adolescence, the dance studio has been a safe place for me to avoid the pressures of math tests and complicated friendships. Even more than that, my family at my dance studio has helped me process and come to terms with my own struggles with anxiety. We all have those days when leaving our bed seems impossible, but dance is always the reason I get out of my bed on Saturday mornings. I realize how necessary it is for me to get in the studio and as my favorite TV duo, Meredith Grey and Christina Yang would say, dance it out. I recognize that physical exercise is no panacea for all mental illness, but we do know that there is some neuroscience that helps explain why it has been so impactful on both Sarah and me. As it turns out, my major interests of dance and the human brain aren't polar opposites. Instead, they combine to help me make a difference in someone's life and learn a lot along the way. Experiences like these challenge us to ignite our inner curiosities and to take charge, no matter what tiny and silent package they may come in. Thank you.